Chapter Thirteen of Mounted Police Life in Canada. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Mounted Police Life in Canada by Captain Burton Dean. Chapter Thirteen Mounted Police Law. The raison d'etre of the subject matter of the following chapter is to be found in the circumstances that, at the date of which I speak, the relations of the mounted police courts to the ordinary courts of law stood as an unknown quantity. There was an undefined feeling that they were subject to the control and supervision of the Supreme Court, but the question had never been raised in a concrete form, and neither bench nor bar was interested in the abstract question i had on one or two occasions noticed on the part of young aggressive lawyers indications which led me to think that some day the question might be raised in a matter that would call for a pronouncement thereupon by some competent authority but so far there had been no clash in the month of november eighteen ninety eight however the monster raised his head in such an uncompromising fashion that something had to be done to settle the dispute for all time as it happened it fell to my lot to take the assertive monster in hand and as it also happened perhaps fortunately it had fallen to my lot to learn in my old corps some military law which no other officer in or connected with the mounted police had had occasion or opportunity to learn the difficulty came to a head in this wise in november eighteen ninety eight i was in command of the division at macleod as well as of that at Lethbridge, and used to spend four days of each week at the former place. Belonging to one of the detachments of the MacLeod Division was a constable named B. O. Nettleship. It happened that on November 29th, this constable would complete the term of service for which he had engaged, and would be entitled to claim his discharge. He had recently come into a legacy of a few hundred dollars, and intended to settle in British Columbia he was a man of whom i personally knew nothing but his record was good he had been a handy man in his detachment and was a fairly good axeman etc and i felt quite kindly disposed to him when therefore he appeared before me on the morning of november twenty third and asked me to give him leave of absence until the end of his term and to allow him to sign off as it was called before he left so that he would not have to come back on the twenty ninth to complete his discharge papers, I cordially agreed. I convened the usual board of officers to carry out the regulations in such a case, namely to verify and record the particulars of the man's service, to adjust his accounts, and to ascertain whether or not he had any claim against the government in connection with his past service. This was all a pure matter of form usual in every disciplinary community of which i have had any knowledge and was designed not only to protect the government in the future but to see that the person about to be discharged was in process of receiving all dues that were properly coming to him during my weekly visit to macleod i had to compress about a week's work into four days and was naturally kept pretty busy that afternoon while in my office the door between that and the clerk's office being open, I was very much annoyed by the strident tones of a man's voice, which seemed to have a great deal more to say than was necessary. And at last it worked so much upon my nerves that I called to the chief clerk and asked who the man was and why he was talking so much. The sergeant replied that the man was Constable Nettleship, whose discharge papers were being made out by the board of officers, and that he was under the influence of liquor. I said, send him out of the office at once, to return to duty. His pass is cancelled. Let the sergeant major know. This was the only alternative to placing the man under arrest on a charge of intoxication, however slight. According to the wording of the Mounted Police Act, I thought that in all probability he would reappear next morning, say he was sorry, and renew his application for leave. I had it vaguely in my mind that if he should do so, I would give him his leave and let him go. This, however, proved to be the last thing that Nettleship intended to do, for in the course of the same afternoon he deserted. He went to stay with some friends of his in MacLeod, who kept him perdue for a couple of days or so at a great risk to themselves, 
and then he developed diphtheria. The health officer promptly isolated him in the pest house and applied to me to make the necessary arrangements for his medical attendance, nursing, and maintenance. I replied that a man of the name he mentioned was then in a state of desertion from the Northwest Mounted Police, and I declined to accept any responsibility for his medical attendance, etc. I added that he was quite able to pay his own expenses. There was at that time, living and practicing in MacLeod, a very clever lawyer. To him, Nettleship applied for advice in his dilemma. The proposition made was quite simple. Nettleship had money which was burning a hole in his pocket, and his legal adviser was quite willing to relieve him of any inconvenient surplus. The lawyer advised his client that he was no longer a member of the police force, and he may, for aught I know, have honestly believed that the advice he was giving was good. I made no secret of my intention to hold Nettleship accountable for his act of desertion as soon as he should be released from quarantine, and the lawyer then made application to a judge of the Supreme Court, sitting in Calgary, for a writ of prohibition. The affidavits upon which this application was based bristled with falsehoods, and I made a trip to Calgary with material to contradict them. While at Calgary, I spent Sunday afternoon with an old Regina friend, Mr. Justice D. L. Scott, and to him I confided my troubles. He listened patiently for a time, and at last said, Dean, do you mean to tell me that I cannot issue a writ of prohibition to prevent you from doing something that I think you ought not to do? I replied, That's exactly what I do mean. So long as I do not exceed my jurisdiction, you have no lawful right whatever to interfere with me. In general terms, I explained the situation as I asserted it to be, and he finally said, Well, if what you say is correct, I suppose there is something in your contention. I had applied to headquarters prior to my visit to Calgary for authority to employ Mr. C. C. McCall, a Calgary lawyer, to represent the mounted police in this matter being well assured that he would at all events have taken some trouble to look into the matter. But he was what the Grits called a Tory, and my application found no favour. The Liberal Party was then in power, and wanted every visible fragment of the loaves and fishes. The Northwest Territories were a sort of private game reserve, operated principally in the interests of the Sifton family, the prominent member of which, was the Minister of the Interior in the Dominion Cabinet. I was therefore in no way surprised when I received instructions to employ Mr. A. L. Sifton, who was the Calgary Crown Prosecutor at the time. This gentleman had, in his official capacity, previously mishandled an excellent case for me, so I hardened my heart, left my case in his hands, and returned to my command to work up the case myself. In course of time, the case came up for argument in chambers at Calgary, and a lawyer who was present remarked to me afterwards, If I had not known that Sifton was representing the police, I should have thought he was appearing for the other side. It was no wonder, then, that the rule Nisi was issued, and I was prohibited from dealing with nettleship. The prejudice of the learned judge obtruded in every line. He set up a man of straw and battered him out of all recognition, to the admiration and delight of counsel on both sides. In the meantime, I had laid a charge of perjury against Nettleship on one of the many false statements in his numerous affidavits, and insisted the Crown Prosecutor at Lethbridge, Mr. C. F. P. Coneybear, K. C., to appear for the Crown. The charge was fully proved by the only two witnesses, besides Nettleship, who knew the facts, who positively contradicted the accused. But the judge showed his bias again, took the case from the jury, and directed them to return a verdict of not guilty, which they did. Then Mr. Coneybear, as instructed by myself, gave notice of appeal to the court in Banco against the writ of prohibition. We had got on to a business footing at last, and the ball was with me. My friend Coney Bear had the most excellent law library, which he placed unreservedly at my disposal, and during the ensuing weeks I made full use of it, and burnt many gallons of midnight oil in preparing that which would effectively call my opponent's bluff. 
On March 10, 1899, I was ready for the fray, for on that day I dated to the Commissioner of the Mounted Police a letter which epitomized the results of my labours and researches. This letter, I knew, would be referred to the Department of Justice at Ottawa, and from there it was forwarded to Mr. A. L. Sifton at Calgary to prosecute the appeal. That gentleman could not, without breach of professional etiquette, take out of Mr. Conybear's hands the actions which the latter had initiated. And so, fortunately, we were able to travel still along business lines. The letter contained a good deal of interesting matter, dicta of eminent English judges, and so forth, known to an extremely limited circle of professional men in the Northwest. But as the text is by far too long to be here reproduced in extenso, I shall here mention only that, after having marshalled my evidence, I concluded by saying, I submit that the Northwest Mounted Police, if not a military body, are as nearly military as it is possible for an armed body of constabulary to be, that the statute, by virtue of which they exist, enjoins and provides for the maintenance of discipline, and that their discipline is essentially of a military character. Their regulations, respecting the grant of an indulgence of a pass, and the form of pass itself, are adopted from those in vogue in the British Army. They are purely matters affecting the interior economy and discipline of the Northwest Mounted Police. Similarly, the regulations and customs affecting the grant of discharge from the force are a question of interior economy and discipline. The question of the pass is the crux of the whole matter, for, apart from that, the question of the discharge would never have been raised. It is clear from the learned judge's minutes of judgment that the questions of pass and discharge must stand or fall together. This being so, I am entitled to contend, on the lines of Chief Baron Kelly's judgment, that the issue and subsequent cancellation of Constable Nettleship's pass affected a police indulgence granted by a police officer in his capacity of commanding officer of police to a police constable, admittedly under his command, and that the question being thus purely of a police character involving a question of police discipline alone is cognizable only by a police tribunal and not by a court of law. An eminent grit lawyer and politician in MacLeod, Mr. Malcolm Mackenzie, to whom I showed my letter, remarked as he handed it back to me, If your counsel does nothing more than take that letter into court and read it, he cannot lose his case. It is not a brief, it is a complete argument. The case for the mounted police was very ably represented by Mr. Conybear to the court in Banco at Regina. One of the judges, Mr. Justice Maguire, had apparently heard Judge Rulo's side of the story, and interjected so many interruptions to Mr. Conybear while he was speaking, that, to use the expression of a lawyer who was present and told me afterwards, he almost heckled him. However, Mr. Conybear withstood the ordeal with unshaken imperturbability, and the end of it was that Mr. Justice Maguire, after Judge Wetmore had written the judgment of the court, added a judgment of his own, giving reasons additional to those given by the court why the writ of prohibition should be quashed. It would be too tedious to set forth these judgments at length. The judgment of the court, as rendered by Judge Wetmore, concluded in the following words. This being so, we must find that the order of Mr. Justice Rouleau was granted incautiously, and, in view of what appears above, it is not considered necessary to allude to any other questions raised in the appeal. The judgment of the court is that the order granted by the learned judge be rescinded, and the writ of prohibition issued thereon and all proceedings thereunder set aside with cost to be paid by the respondent. When Nettleship's counsel was subsequently notified of this issue, all that he had to say was, Oh, well, I got all that I wanted out of it. His advocacy was said to have netted him from $1,200 to $1,300. He had the money, and Nettleship had the experience. Previously, it had been the other way about. To arrest Nettleship and prosecute him for his desertion would, I thought, have looked like a persecution. 
so I took no steps to carry into effect the logical sequence of the full court's dicta. I looked at Nettleship in a quite impersonal light. What I was wholly and solely concerned with was to place the mounted police courts on a solid footing, and I think most readers will agree with me that some such steps was imperatively necessary. End of chapter 13fourteen of mounted police life in canada this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org mounted police life in canada by captain burton dean chapter fourteen an unrecorded incident of mounted police history the crooked lakes affair on the evening of february twentieth eighteen eighty four I was requested to go to the commanding officer's quarters, and there I met Mr. Hayter Reed in conference with Superintendent Hirchmer. The Lieutenant Governor of the Northwest Territories, who was also Commissioner of Indian Affairs, had gone away on leave and had appointed Mr. Hayter Reed, the Assistant Commissioner of Indian Affairs, to be administrator during his absence. Mr. Reed had been an Indian agent at Battleford in the days when Superintendent Hirchmer had been stationed there in command of the Mounted Police Post, and a close friendship had sprung up between them. Mr. Reed was thus at this time administering the affairs of the country, and his word was law. On the line of the Canadian Pacific Railway, about eighty miles east of Regina, is a place called Broadview, and about ten miles north of the village, as it was then, was an Indian reserve. A report from the local Indian department officials had just been received by the administrator that about sixty or seventy Indians had broken into the government storehouse, had threatened the life of the farm instructor, a Mr. Keith, and had stolen some sixty or seventy bags of flour and bacon. Mr. Reed's mission was able to ask that a posse of police be sent to the spot to look into the matter. It was finally settled that I should go in charge of ten men, who were not to take their arms. They would take their side-arms, of course, but not their carbines. A freight train was due to pass Regina at 9.45 o'clock next morning, and we went to the station to catch it, but it did not come until 3 p.m., and it was 9 p.m. when we reached Broadview. We had had very sketchy meals during the day, so supper was the first consideration and teams and bobsleighs were ordered for 10.30 p.m. I then went to see Mr. Dodd, who was the resident J.P., and had a chat with him. He was very pessimistic, and advised me not to go out to the reserve with so few men, but I said it was my duty to go, and that I should assuredly do so. It seemed that Mr. Keith had been in Broadview, expecting us to arrive earlier in the day, but had grown tired of waiting, and had gone back to the reserve. He left a message with Mr. Dodd to the effect that the matter was very serious, that the Indians were armed, and had sworn to shoot the first man who attempted to arrest one of them. He quoted Mr. Mackenzie, a trader living on the reserve and doing business for the Hudson's Bay Company, as saying that the Indians were uglier than any Indians he had ever seen. We were fated not to reach the reserve that night, for it presently transpired that the only procurable horses were tired after a day's work which they had already done, and that the guide who was to show us the way to the farm buildings was by no means sure of the road. Considering that Mr. Keith had not thought it necessary to wait for us, I concluded that there was perhaps no desperate need of haste, and ordered the teams for 7.30 the next morning. Before going to bed, I wired an epitome of the local opinion to Superintendent Hirchmer. It was clear and calm when we started the next morning, with the snow rather deep and the thermometer about 30 degrees below zero. Travelling was slow, and we did not reach the farm until 9.30 a.m. Mr. Keith then secured some jumpers for the further progress of the party on account of the deep snow, and it was half-past ten before we fairly got under way. We were, of course, entirely in Mr. Keith's hands, and his idea was to visit each of the minor chiefs and to ascertain where his Indians were to be found. Fortunately, he had provided a very competent interpreter, a full-blooded Indian named Gaddy, 
who had the reputation of being honest enough and independent enough to interpret correctly without fear or favour. He could, moreover, understand and interpret good English. The first minor chief that we visited was named Little Child and was at home. He was almost blind and had no taste for frivolities. He said he was sorry the young men would go in for dancing instead of working. His good example seemed to have impressed the rest of his band, for only one of them was implicated in the current disturbances. We had here to wait for a guide to be procured, because we had to break our own trail, and it was necessary in the few hours of daylight to make as many shortcuts as possible. We made a meal on some grub that we had brought with us, and then headed for Yellow Calf's house. He was the chief of the combination, had raised a fairly good crop, and was supposed to be loyal. We found his flag flying, but no one at home save squaws. From thence we proceeded to Acousas, whose squaws were at home, but no one else. At 5 p.m. we went down to the valley, and in course of time came to the house of a half-breed named Jacob Bear. There we came across the most astute Indian of the whole tribe, named Usoop. It was uncertain how far he gave the other Indians the assistance of his sympathy, but no overt act had ever been traced to him. He was in fairly good circumstances, dressed respectably, was a good hunter, and talked intelligible English. From him we learned that the Indians, some sixty or seventy in number, were in a house close to the river. Also, he offered to take us to the place. I asked him if he would tell the Indians that I was there and should like to have a talk with them, and that I should like to take with me Mr. Keith, Sergeant Bliss, and the interpreter. He returned with a message that the Indians were willing that I should, as I had proposed, and then I sent the rest of my men back to the farm. We had driven about twenty-five miles in the junipers, and it was seven o'clock, time for a meal, if there had been one in sight, which there wasn't. The house which we were about to enter was a substantially built log house, with one door facing the east and one small window facing the south, a one-roomed house measuring about thirty feet by eighteen feet. An oblong excavation from eighteen inches to two feet deep had been made in the centre, and the Indians were sitting around this oblong, with others standing behind them. The place was literally packed with Indians, and it was as much as we could do to find standing room. However, we eventually did so, and I stood at the northwest corner of the dugout, which was a convenient place for speaking from. When I first went in at the door, I stepped, of course, into the evacuation, not being able to see it, and not knowing it was there, and very nearly came a cropper, at which there was a general guffaw. Without wasting any time, however, I told the Indians that I was very glad to have the opportunity of talking to them. That complaint had been made that a large number of Indians had broken into the government warehouse, had threatened the life of the farm instructor, and had stolen a great many bags of flour and bacon, and the great white mother had sent me to ask them what they had to say about it. I said, The great white mother is very sorry to hear that her Indian children have done this wicked thing. She keeps a store of food on the reserve so that her Indian children shall not starve. She gives them of this food every two or three days, and expects that they will be content with what she gives them, without money and without price. She feels quite sure that her Indian children would not have stolen her goods unless some bad men had put bad thoughts into their hearts, and she expects that those Indians who led the others in this bad act will give themselves up to be tried in her court, in the same way as white men are tried when they break the Queen's law. That, and much more to the same effect, through more than two weary hours, each sentence was interpreted as it was uttered, and while the interpreter was doing his part, I was thinking out the next sentence in words of one syllable as nearly as possible. Three Indians replied in speeches of some length, and said that promises had been made to them by the Indian commissioner which had not been kept, and that the assistant Indian commissioner had cut down their rations in a manner which constituted a breach of faith. They argued also that they helped themselves to the flour and bacon because they were hungry, I thought a good deal more of the Indian's complaint then than I do now, for the burden of the red man's song is always grub, grub, more grub. These rascals had been dancing for thirteen days straight on end, 
and had neglected even to go and draw their rations. Hence the occasion for the theft. I told them that I would tell the Indian Department what they said, and advised them, if they seriously intended to attempt to explain their conduct by the representation that they were hungry, to show their good faith by giving up the leaders of the raid to be tried by the courts. They replied that they would talk it over, and if I would stay there overnight, they would give me an answer in the morning. There was no place that I knew of wherein I could stay for the night, and having had nothing to eat since midday, I decided that I had better go back to the farm. So I told them there might be some messages there for me which might require an answer, and that it was necessary that I should go. The Indians were perfectly respectful and friendly from first to last. There was one, and only one, who meant to be offensive. He asked me as I was going out of the door what the police were going to do about his horses, which he had lost some time previously. His tone and manner were distinctly impertinent, and I made him answer a good many questions, asking finally if he had reported to the police that he had lost his horses. He said no, and I retorted, How did you expect the police to know that your horses were lost if you did not tell them? An approving ugh behind me indicated that at least one of my hearers had a logical mind, and under cover of it I went out into the night. We had talked from 7 to 9.15 p.m., and it was 11 o'clock before we reached the farm. I found there a telegram from Herchmer to say that he and ten more men were on the way. He arrived the next day in the forenoon, having brought no arms, and about one o'clock we all started for the house in the valley. Colonel MacDonald, Indian agent, also arrived in his own cutter and preceded us. The Indians, of course, were watching us and knew exactly what was going on. When we came in sight of the house, we could see that there were a number of armed Indians round about it. Some had shotguns and some had Winchester rifles, but every Indian present had a firearm of some sort. As Colonel MacDonald was driving up to the door, the men who were standing there sternly waved him off. They made the same signs to us, but we took no notice of them, and the entire party got out of their respective sleighs. Herchmer was very impatient. Colonel MacDonald, who had not spoken to the Indians at all, wanted to talk, but Herchmer would have none of it. He told me to fall the men in, and I did so. Then he said, You'd better draw pistols, and I gave that order also. Instantly, the heels of a butt was applied to the window sash, which fell out with a crash, and the cavity bristled with muzzles. Indians simultaneously appeared around the corners of the house, all having arms and all being ready to shoot. Finding remonstrance useless, Colonel MacDonald whipped up his horse and drove off, saying, I'll have nothing to do with it. Herchmer and I were two or three paces between our line of men and the house when, without warning me of what he proposed to do, Herchmer suddenly said, Well, I suppose we'd better go right in, and started off by himself. Everyone who knew Billy Herchmer knew that, whatever his failings were, lack of courage was not one of them, and he presumed that bluff would carry the day, as it had previously answered his purpose in the north. He had not made allowance for a band of Indians who were strangers to him, and were, as Mr. Mackenzie had told me, very determined. In the north he had been accustomed to deal with the Crees, but the Indians with whom we were now dealing were Soto, who were always looked upon as a rather superior race. A young fellow named Jim Holford, consumed with curiosity, had, as we learned afterwards, followed our sleighs on horseback into the valley but an Indian had warned him to go back, saying if there was going to be any fighting, he would be killed with the rest of us. He took the advice and went. Herchmer had taken no more than a couple of paces towards the door when a big, fine-looking and determined Indian, who was guarding the door, presented his double-barreled shotgun full in his face at a distance of something like two feet. Herchmer stopped dead, as in my opinion he was well advised to do for there was certain murder in the dusky ruffian's eye. The other Indians followed his example, and we were all covered. A moment on the part of any one of us would have precipitated a climax. As the seconds passed without any ulterior act, it became evident that it remained with ourselves to force the situation or not. 
I do not know what Herchmer proposed to do in the house, even supposing the Indians had admitted us all. We had no warrant to arrest anyone, no information had been laid, and neither of us knew who the guilty parties were. Thus, from a criminal point of view, we had no locus standi whatever. We were, in effect, provoking the Indians to commit willful murder by threatening to thrust ourselves into premises into which we had no right to force our way without the Queen's warrant. If disaster had befallen us, as for two or three seconds seemed extremely probable, our blood would have been upon our own heads. Presently, Herchmer called for Yellow Calf, the chief, who persuaded the big Indian to lower his gun and talk became once more the order of the day. The big Indian was not easily appeased. His blood was up, and he wanted to pull the trigger at some one of the men. I could not tell which one, nor why he wanted to shoot, but I thought he would do some mischief, and Yellow Calf thought so too, for he held on to the gun for some little time. It is to remembered that up to this time no shot had ever been fired in anger between the police and the Indians, and a very grave responsibility would thus rest upon any person who should initiate hostilities. At this juncture the Indian agent reappeared, and an adjournment was made to Usopp's house, a little way off where a prolonged powwow was held. The Indians, however, were no longer in the complacent mood of the evening before. They had hardened their hearts, and resolutely refused to give up the offenders. An arrangement was made, providing that the administrator should be sent for, and we wended our way back to the farm, where we arrived about 8 p.m. Hater Reed arrived on the following afternoon, and the Indian agent was dispatched to invite the Indians to a conference at the farm next morning. He stayed with them all that night, and eventually succeeded in inducing them to come and talk matters over. At about 9 a.m. on February 25, Usopp, Yellow Calf, and some others, escorted by armed and mounted braves in full war paint, duly arrived, and the whole forenoon was spent in talk. The administrator said after a time that he would like to talk to some of the young men themselves, and after some difficulty they were persuaded to come very nervous and fearful of treachery late in the afternoon after an eloquent speech from osop interpreter gaddy said it was the finest speech he had ever heard an indian make four indians named yellow calf kanawas moise and penny pakesis consented to go to regina for trial and we all took the night train thither the trial took place on february twenty eighth before colonel richardson stipendary magistrate and kenawas moise and penny pakesis were charged with larceny yellow calf was not included in the indictment as he was not concerned in the raid and had moreover kept the peace on the previous day mr a e forget now senator clerk of the legislative assembly appeared on behalf of the accused who pleaded guilty and made a strong plea for mercy on account of the Indians' ignorance of the white men's laws. The Indians were convicted and discharged on suspended sentence. It was practically understood from the first that this was to be the outcome of the trial. When the court rose, Colonel Richardson called Herchmer and me into his room and said, What were you gentlemen doing there without a warrant? My answer was easy. I simply obeyed orders which I received from my superior officer. Herchmer's answer was not so easy, and he said nothing. All this, looked at from any point of view, was a very unfortunate occurrence. The police had made a faux pas, and had lost in a great measure their most valuable asset, their prestige. The story was naturally noised about among the Indians, and there is no doubt that it contributed somewhat to the turbulent spirit which manifested itself among the Battleford Indians later in the same year. So far as the government was concerned, the matter was promptly hushed up. Herchmer never made any allusion to it in any of his reports. I wrote the report which Hayter Reed sent to his department, and he struck out of it all reference to the complaints made by the Indians that they were starving. There were in those days only four newspapers in the whole of the Northwest Territories that is, the leader at Regina, 
Fort Macleod Gazette at Macleod, the Saskatchewan Herald at Battleford, and the Bulletin at Edmonton. I never saw any account of the trouble in any of these papers until October 1887. The Edmonton Bulletin published an editorial on the subject. It was used as a vehicle to attack the Lieutenant Governor, the Assistant Indian Commissioner Herchmer himself, and his brother, who had been in 1886 appointed to the Commissionership of the Mounted Police. Thus it will be seen that the story took rather more than three years and a half to filter through to Edmonton from Broadview. The Indian Department in those days had some very persistent critics in Parliament who did not think it necessary by any means to confine themselves to the truth in making virulent attacks upon the departmental officials. It may be imagined, therefore, how careful the latter were to conceal anything which could be used to their discredit by their unscrupulous enemies in the opposition. The editorial, to which I have alluded, closed in the following words. Bad management has been succeeded by worse, and bad precedent by still worse, until the force, which was the pride of Canada and the safety of the Northwest, has been made a laughingstock for the very men who a few years ago held it most in respect. I could, if I chose, write a great deal on the subject from this aspect, but as I have set out to write nothing of which I have not a personal knowledge, I refrain. I can only say that in the interval between October 1st, 1887, and the time at which these lines are written, nous avons changé tout cela. There is now living only one white man who knows all the particulars attending the Emute at Crooked Lakes, Mr. Mackenzie, to whom I referred. He kept a small trading establishment on the reserve and was in the confidence of the Indians. It was suggested to me that I should submit my narrative to Mr. Mackenzie and ask him whether his recollections agreed with mine. I judged it highly expedient to do so, knowing how often I myself had grown tired of hearing tales current in the Northwest which were more or less figments of the imaginations of the narrators. I received in return from Mr. Mackenzie a long letter and afterward a very kind intimation. You are at liberty to make any use of my letter that you see fit. The following is an excerpt from the letter referred to. I have a very vivid recollection of that very regrettable and unwarranted disturbance at Crooked Lakes in 1884. Your story and review of all the details is most complete, faithfully portrayed, and in accordance with the facts as they actually took place. I was in charge of the Hudson's Bay Company's trading post on the Crooked Lakes Reserve, continuously some years prior and subsequent to the 1884 trouble. I grew up with all those young men implicated, knew every soul on all the reserves personally, spoke the language, and was conversant with the daily circumstances of each individual family. It is a long story, with which you are no doubt conversant, how the Plains Indians were being gathered together, at and prior to that time by the government, and being placed on different reservations. Crooked Lakes, being one of the largest, received the greatest number of Indians, and of course in those days had to be fed regularly or rationed regularly. The reducing of these rations from time to time to practically nothing in the hard winter of 1884, when there were no rabbits or anything else to hunt for food, brought these Indians face to face with actual starvation. In some cases, children died of starvation during that month, their mothers not being able to suckle them from their weakened condition, from lack of even partial nourishment at this critical period. Mr. Reed further instructed Mr. H. Keith to reduce the rations still lower. I asked Mr. Keith, for God's sake, not to reduce their rations any lower, or there would certainly be trouble. He carried out Mr. Reed's instructions. A few more died. The Indians came and asked for grub, which they were denied, broke into the government storehouse, threw out as much flour and bacon as they wanted, and threw Keith out on top of it. I ran up from my store in time to save Keith's life, took him away from them, and told him what a foolish mistake he had made. Before I got him to my store, he took one of his fits which he was subject to, and remained unconscious for fully an hour. 
In the meantime, the Indians were loading up their jumpers with flour and bacon, and making a general distribution to those present, and sending flour and bacon on to those who were too feeble to come after it. While the air was about thirty degrees below zero that morning, after they divided up the flour and bacon, they all came to my store, all, of course, very excited, but offered me no violence. Only some of my best friends among them said in a jocular way that they had come in to clean up my store also, as they wanted tea, tobacco, sugar, rice, and currants, so that they would have one good feed before they all died of starvation. I told them not to touch anything, that I had been helping many of them a good deal all winter, and was very sorry for what they had done in a moment of excitement, through the foolhardiness of one of their young men, for which all the Indians would now be held responsible by the government, whose name was Big Ben Kitchy, Usopp's son. I gave them what they wanted, and they all went their way to prepare the feast, having plenty of grub for the time being for themselves and families, after which the young warriors repaired to the house in the valley in which you found them, and it was very lucky for the MP that day that the Indians had had a good feed." so that their tempers were somewhat cooled off by their stomachs being full, or there would not one of you ever have come out of that valley alive, hampered as you were with your buffalo coats, deep snow, and with only side arms. I shudder yet when I think of what would have occurred had a shot been fired even by accident. There is many a slip betwixt the cup and the lip, and anyway that great tragedy was averted by a bloodless battle. I am the only living white man today that was on the ground and was intimately and personally acquainted with all the details of this affair, which I reported to my company at that time, and received their thanks for the way I handled the Indians and prevented them from looting our stores by providing them gratuitously with small amounts of provisions on that deplorable and critical occasion. They were supplied with a more liberal ration after that time, and there was no further trouble on that score until the following spring in March 1885, when the rebellion broke out at Duck Lake. End of chapter 14all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Mounted Police Life in Canada by Captain Burton Dean. Chapter 15. Wholesale Cattle Smuggling. In the month of November 1901, the collector of United States Customs at Great Falls in the state of Montana, a place about 140 miles south of Lethbridge, wrote to me to ask what brands the firm of Spencer Brothers were using in Canada, and whether they had any cattle branded with a double rowlock. I was aware that these people were American citizens, who had recently leased from the Dominion government a large quantity of land. They were reputed to be wealthy, and to have a great number of very fine cattle. Beyond that, my attention had not been particularly directed to them. I now learned that the firm consisted of two brothers, Samuel and John, that they were intensely unpopular in the state of Montana, and that they had conceived the brilliant idea of coming to northwest Canada and leasing a large quantity of land at two cents an acre in the immediate proximity of the international boundary. William Taylor, their manager, is my authority for the statement that a sum of money had been set down in the Canadian estimates for the year 1902, for the purpose of building a fence along the international boundary line. The project was not carried into effect, but that such a ridiculous proposition had even been taken into serious consideration shows what influence the Spencer brothers had with the government at Ottawa. The diagram herewith shows a plan of the lease, namely townships number one in ranges five and six, and townships number two in ranges six, seven, and eight, as each township measures six miles north and south by six miles east and west, and consists of thirty-six square miles, it follows that the firm had one hundred and eighty square miles of the public domain under lease. But this was not all the advantage they derived, for a glance at the map will show how the leased land bestrides the Milk River, 
which flows out of Canada into Montana in Township 1, Range 5. The Spencers thus controlled at least 24 miles of river frontage, and as there was no other water within striking distance, it is evident that Townships 1 of Ranges 7 and 8 would be of no use to any stock owner who might be denied access to the Milk River. The Spencers thus virtually acquired 72 additional square miles of grazing land for which they paid not a cent. Everyone will admit that this was a long-headed scheme which deserved to succeed, but it must not be imagined that such extensive privileges could be obtained for the mere asking. Not at all. The Minister of the Interior of that day, who had control of the Dominion lands, was Mr. Clifford Sifton, who, prior to his joining Sir Wilfrid Laurier's cabinet in 1896, had practiced law in Brandon, Manitoba. When the brothers Spencer coveted the concessions which have been described, they were astute enough to reason that it might be to their advantage to do their legal business through the firm of lawyers which Mr. Sifton had ostensibly left. Results proved that their line of reasoning was unimpeachable. They had to pay a large sum of money, it is true, but they got what they wanted, and the game was worth the candle. A few years later, another American firm, the Price Conrad Company, desired similarly to milk the good old Canadian cow, and used the same milking stool. The concessions they wanted were near Maple Creek. Their idea was to lease detached townships here and there, selected in such a way as to give them practical control of the intervening area for nothing. The emissary, whom they sent eastward to pull the strings, wired from Ottawa to his principal at Maple Creek. We can get it, but it comes high. To which the immediate answer was returned. Must have it at any price. They got it, and it was the emissary who told the story. Following the examples of the Spencers, other American cattlemen had driven their herds to the Canadian frontier in order that they might fatten on Canadian grass of which there was an abundance, while the feed to the south of the line was eaten off, and a special officer of customs was detailed to attend to the matter. Having no means himself of watching a long boundary line, he was perforce dependent upon us for information and assistance, his own participation being confined to making out the seizure papers and reporting to Ottawa. He made some seizures during my tenure of command at Maple Creek between July 1902 and July 1906, and, except in one instance where the owner had not apparently learned the tricks of the trade, and had in consequence to pay a penalty, the cattle were ordered to be returned by the department at Ottawa without payment of duty. There was no earthly reason why they should not all have been treated alike, but so it was. To hark back to my correspondence with the collector of U.S. Customs, I learned from him that in November 1901, the Spencers had shipped a trainload of cattle, 176 head, from their Milk River ranch to the Chicago market. This shipment was intercepted by the U.S. Customs officer held at St. Paul while en route to Chicago, and not permitted to proceed to its destination until after the Spencers had deposited the sum of $2,355 with the secretary of the Montana Stock Growers Association as customs duty. In November 1900, the brothers had informed the secretary of the Northern Montana Roundup Association that they had moved all their cattle into Canada, and on that account declined to pay their pro rata share of the Montana Roundup expenses. I saw the letters of both brothers and took copies of them. An indictment which the United States brought against the firm in March 1902 failed because only ten instead of twelve jurors of the grand jury voted for it. A special agent of the United States Treasury Department was sent from Tacoma to take charge of the case, and the authorities were very much chagrined at having been outwitted great influence had been brought to bear upon the jurymen. The Grand Sovereign of the Independent Order of Odd Fellows was very active in the interests of the Spencers, whose success emboldened them to think that Canadian justice could be similarly tampered with. Sam Spencer had a favourite expression, We'll law them, and he was never averse to going to the law. 
as the united states officials pursued their investigation they came across a great deal of evidence which was most valuable to me and they gave me without stint all the assistance which they possibly could for instance on april twenty fifth nineteen hundred the firm imported and paid duty on five hundred and twenty seven calves all less than twelve months old my american friends obtained from me an affidavit from one of the spencer's employees who assisted to drive about a thousand head of cattle to the Canadian frontier. The 527 calves were there cut out of the bunch and were driven to a mounted police detachment called Writing on Stone, where duty was paid on them, and the mothers were driven to the Spencer's Range, where the calves subsequently joined them. The same man also gave information as to another drive of about 800, which took place in October of the same year and as to the particulars of that, I was enabled to procure an affidavit from another employee of the Spencers who took part in the importation. In addition to this, every stockman in northern Montana was eager to give us information, and we had an abundance of it. This ebullition of the feeling against the Spencers on the part of their fellow countrymen was brought about as follows. Ever since they had been established on their Milk River lease, the firm, relying on their influence at Ottawa, had assumed that they could do as they pleased. During the winter of 1901, a great many American cattle had drifted into Canada. The range in northern Montana had been largely burnt off by prairie fires, and the only feed available for some 15,000 head of cattle was in the neighborhood of the Sweet Grass Hills, where the grass was good, and the stockmen concerned had no choice but to range their cattle there or let them starve to death. This meant that the cattle must be pastured within a latitude of about twenty miles of the Canadian frontier. Within that distance there was no water readily accessible except that in the Milk River, which meandered eastward at a distance of from ten to twelve miles north of the boundary line. I had always recognized the fact that it was a sheer impossibility to hold thirsty range cattle back from water, and had always impressed upon the owners of trespassing cattle that they should do their utmost to prevent their animals from crossing to the northern bank. There were at that time no Canadian settlers on the south side of the river to be inconvenienced by incursions of stray cattle. The American cattlemen recognized their obligation to protect Canadian interests on the northern bank, and were in the habit of maintaining line riders to keep the cattle back. These men used to lodge at our detachment buildings, and in return for their board and lodging, used to keep the mounted police detachments supplied with fresh beef at the expense of their employers. This system had been established by me years previously, and had been then fully reported upon and explained in my annual report for the information of Parliament. The revenue suffered to the extent that no duty was charged or paid on any animal so killed for food, and the customs officers, who were fully aware of the circumstances, and never disdained to partake of the beef when their business took them into those parts, never thought proper to raise the question. In the exercise of their assumed prerogative, Spencer Brothers arrogated to themselves the right to control a large stretch of prairie about seventy miles long by twenty miles wide, and on one occasion, during the winter of 1901, they gathered some two thousand head of American cattle, which had been storm-driven to the northern bank of the river, and drove them across to the south side. One of the American cowboy line riders, George Voice, was present, and pointed out that the ice was rotten. He vigorously protested against the proposed movement, but the Spencer's manager said he did not care. He would drive them across no matter what might happen, and he and his men did so. Fortunately, more by good luck than good management, there were no casualties. But the indignant cowboy told the story far and wide in northern Montana, and there was not a cattle owner there who was not anxious to get back at the Spencer's, their renegade countrymen. Hence it was that I was able to collect so much information and the report which I was able to make to my department was as full and conclusive as it was possible for a report to be. The reply of the Customs Department at Ottawa was to send a special service officer to cooperate with me. 
His instructions were to inform the firm of Spencer Brothers that they were charged with having smuggled into Canada about 500 head of cattle in April 1900, that the duty paid value of these would be about $15,000, and he was to demand payment of a deposit of $7,500, subject to the final decision of the Minister of Customs. If the firm consented to pay this demand, the officer was to wire to his minister for further instructions. Accordingly, on Good Friday, 1902, Mr. Bourinot and I started by train for Coutts, a station on the boundary line, and from there by road eastward about 55 miles to a mounted police detachment situate in Pendant d'Oriel, Coulis, within about seven miles of the Spencer's ranch. Bourinot drove in a police buckboard while I rode with George Voice, the American cowboy before mentioned. He had spent the winter on the Milk River and gave me a great deal of information which I had not previously had occasion to acquire. We might have saved ourselves a disagreeable trip, for neither of the Spencers was at home, and we had to deal with the manager, William Taylor, who told us that he was also part owner. In reply to Bourinot's communication, he said that his firm had paid duty on every head of stock that they had imported, and that they would not put up a dollar. He told me that the firm then owned 6,000 or 7,000 head of cattle. He could not tell within a 1,000, as they had not counted them for some time. It was known to me, at least, that they had paid duty on only 1,230 animals, 854 of which were calves under 12 months of age, and I was more disposed to believe the range gossip which assessed the cattle smuggled from Montana at from 2,000 to 3,000 head. However, there was nothing for us to do but to go home, which we did. Shortly after this, I attended a meeting of the Western Stock Growers Association, and there asked a prominent stockman what it would cost the government to hire a round-up party of fifteen riders with the necessary etceteras for twenty-one days. George Voice had calculated that it would take that length of time to cover the range. Mr. George Lane replied, fifteen hundred dollars and I then asked if he could supply the party. He said he would. I explained that the proposition was a close secret and must remain so. He finally asked what direction the round-up would probably take, and I said southeast. Then I can guess what your business is, said he. Keep your guesses to yourself at any rate, I replied, and we parted. In course of time, the Customs Department authorized the hiring of the round-up, and everything was arranged with such secrecy that the only people in the West who knew anything about it were George Lane, George Voice, my orderly room clerk, and myself. On Wednesday, May 14th, the round-up party camped a couple miles east of Lethbridge, and Bourinot and I joined them there. I took my clerk with me, mounted, and took two saddle horses for my own use. Bourinot was driven in a light wagon, hauled by a police team. The captain of the round-up, William Playfair, knew what our errand was, and so did an expert cattle buyer named William Henry, whom Mr. Lane had thoughtfully included in the personnel of his party, but none of the other men knew. It was supposed to be George Lane's horse round-up, whose mission ordinarily would be to scour the range for the owner's horses and it was amusing sometimes to hear remarks as to what was Captain Dean's connection with Lane's horse roundup. Voice had been lent to me by the Montana stockman, for whom he was working at the time, and brought his own string of horses with him, ten in number. The other riders were provided with six apiece. We should have started earlier in the year, but extensive prairie fires had in the previous autumn devastated a great tract of the country, over which we wanted to travel, and so we had to wait until sufficient young grass had grown to provide for our needs. 1902 was the year of bad floods in the West, and our journey was very much delayed by heavy rains, which had the compensating advantage of helping the grass to grow. I should not omit to mention something that happened on our second day out. It was after midday dinner. The camp had been struck, and we were on the point of starting again. Voice had saddled and mounted the horse he had chosen for the afternoon. The best in the string, but mean. 
as he described him. When the brute began to buck, he bucked so long and so hard that he finally threw voice over his head, turned a complete somersault, and broke his neck in the doing of it. When we turned our eyes from voice, who was shaking himself to see if there was any harm done, we saw his late mount balanced on his rump and on the horn of the saddle, with his feet in the air, and his head where his tail had been, stone dead. He remained in that position until he was pulled over to allow the saddle to be taken from under him. Some weeks later I wrote to his owner in Montana and asked what value he set upon the horse, as he had been killed in our service. In his reply he said, We lose horses occasionally in about the same manner in which this one acted with voice, and in all probability we would have lost this one sooner or later, or he might have caused the death of a man. I never regret the loss of a horse that will change ends in that way, and I am thankful George escaped, and the horse is dead. I do not wish any pay for him. With kindest regards, I am yours very truly. John Harris Voice caught another horse out of the herd and went about his business as if nothing had happened. The chances of changes of a cowboy's life must be seen to be appreciated. At this time, we were heading for a ranch on the Manyberries Creek, about one hundred miles due east of Lethbridge, and it took us four and one-half days to make the journey. On our arrival there, I found some men and horses whom I had temporarily withdrawn from my Milk River detachments. There, too, I received a report from a special envoy who had been employed for the previous six weeks in watching the Spencer cattle, and this report told me where practically every hoof was to be found. Not a single head was on the Spencer's lease. They were all feeding on the public domain. We now told the men of our party what our errand was, and at 6.30 next morning we all pulled out. The round-up to begin business on the nearest cattle they could find, and Bourinot and I to visit the Spencer's ranch, distant about 30 miles. On our way we were held up for a day and a half at Pendant Doriel detachment by bad weather and impassable roads, but I saw Mr. Taylor in the interval. He told us that he was very glad the inspection was to take place. It was the very thing he wanted. As the ensuing weeks wore on, Mr. Taylor's gratification visibly declined to the vanishing point. On May 21st, Bourinot and I found Brother John at home at the ranch. He was affability itself. He told me that he did not know a doggone thing about the cattle or anything else connected with the ranch. He said Taylor kept what books there were, and he, John Spencer, had never looked at them. He held Taylor responsible. This happened to be election day, and Taylor had gone to vote. We waited at the ranch for him until about four o'clock, and then went back to our lodgings. John Spencer promised that Taylor should bring the books for our inspection, and said that we should part good friends, whatever happened, but he could not pretend to say how we might find the cattle as he knew nothing about them, and had never told a lie in his life. From that time onward, the recording angel had less leisure time in connection with the rancher of pious and patriarchal appearance, who was said, by those amongst whom he had lived for years, to be the crafty member of the firm. Taylor came to see us at Pendant Doriel next morning. He brought one book which showed the amount of duty paid on importations from the United States, but told us nothing that I did not know. On the following day, Bourinot and I reached our round-up camp just before noon. The party had gathered about 2,500 head of cattle, out of which, in the course of the day, about 400 Americans were cut out and held. The others were handed over to Taylor's men to take and keep out of our way. Next day, similarly, about 140 head of Americans were cut out of a bunch of 600. I may as well here explain how our men were guided in their selection of what I call American cattle. The Spencer brothers had in Montana used certain brands, namely the double rowlock on the left ribs and bar 7K and J7 on the left side. They were not allowed to use in Canada the same brands that they had used in the United States, 
For instance, the Canadian brand for the double rowlock cattle was the double rowlock on the right side instead of the left. Sam Spencer was awarded this brand in that place at his own request. In the same way, Canadian brands were awarded in the case of Bar 7K and J7 cattle. This story is not concerned with the particularities of brands, and for the sake of illustrating generally the system in vogue, I will use the case of the double rowlock cattle. An animal bearing that brand on the left ribs was undeniably an animal born and bred in the United States, whether it bore a brand on the right side or whether it did not. It was a common thing to find an American cow with a calf at foot and a yearling heifer or steer following her. Possibly the two offspring bore the Canadian brand without any other at all. This meant that the cow was a smuggled animal. The Spencers would endeavor to call her a stray, that is, a cow which had crossed the imaginary boundary line into Canada without their knowledge or consent. But this claim was defeated by the fact that the cow had been long enough on Canadian soil to have two calves, one over twelve months old, and the other, it may be, only a few weeks old, and the fact that the cow's progeny had been branded with the Spencer's Canadian brand showed conclusively that the cow had been in Canadian territory with their knowledge and consent, and that they had given her some attention as the two calves were still following their mother at the date of our visit. We noticed many cases of that kind. I have previously said that the Spencers had imported and paid duty on 527 head of calves on April 25, 1900. These calves were sworn to be under 12 months old. That meant that any number of cows from 1,000 to 1,500 in number had been despoiled of their calves for the time being, and that they had been driven into Canada at some other point there to meet their calves. The cows were then carefully branded, the cows were not. Some of the cows were doubtless heavy in calf at the time of their importation, and their then unborn calves would be branded when the branding season should come on and opportunities would offer. The ordinary range expectation in the matter of calf crop was one calf to three cows or thereabouts. The casualties were so great, arising from wolves, coyotes, weather accidents, indifferent motherhood, etc., that John Spencer's claim that every one of their cows had a calf was a sheer absurdity. Anyhow, we found a goodly number of dry cows in their herd at the close of our visit. I will recur to this question a little later on. Two notable things happened on Saturday, May 24th. The first was that George Lane drove into camp from Medicine Hat, a distance of about 150 miles, to see how his horse roundup was getting on, and told us that he had that morning seen two men, who were evidently anxious to avoid him, riding hard in a northeasterly direction. The second was that in the course of the afternoon I met Art Strong, Sam Spencer's very capable foreman. I had left word in various quarters that I should like to talk to him, and as a result of some such communication, he now came to visit our camp. He had formerly been a line rider on the Milk River in the employ of some Montana stock owners, and I knew a good deal of him and about him. I knew, for instance, that although he would serve his employer's interests to the utmost, he would not swear to a lie. I feared from the first that by moving Sam Spencer's cattle he might hinder our inquiry, and I had taken the precaution, before I left Lethbridge, of laying an information and obtaining a warrant for his arrest in connection with the importation of calves in April 1900. I intended to have no scruples in putting him out of harm's way if I should have any reason to suspect him of playing tricks with us. It was this I wanted to tell him. After the usual greetings, I said that I wanted to point out to him that if he took upon himself the task of carrying out the unlawful commands of his employers, he might find a difficulty in devoiding himself of responsibility for the execution of orders which he of necessity knew to be unlawful. I told him I had a warrant in my pocket, but I did not want to execute it unless he obliged me to do so, and I also pointed out that all the Spencer cattle were now under seizure by the Customs Department, 
and it would be a serious matter for any person to interfere with the due process of law. He said, They accuse me, don't they, of smuggling a thousand head of cattle at the bone pile in April 1900? I replied, Yes, that is what they say of you. Well, he retorted, I didn't do it. There were only nine hundred in the bunch anyhow, and after I had cut out the calves for customs entry at writing on stone, my orders were to leave the mothers at the line, and I left them there. The bone pile, I should say, was a pile of bones which marked the boundary line. Having got such an admission as this from a hostile witness, I thought myself so fortunate that I said, Oh, well, I'll keep the warrant in my pocket for the present, and I hope you won't give me any occasion to use it. He promised he would not, and we went on our respective ways. Strong statement about the nine hundred cattle, if accepted, and I accepted it unreservedly, emphasized the fraudulent nature of the sworn customs entry as to the 527 calves being all under 12 months of age. There must have been among them a considerable number of yearlings which had reached the age of puberty and were doubtlessly in some cases in the process of becoming mothers themselves. It was no uncommon thing to find on the range a two-year-old heifer with a calf. End of chapter 15, part 1《Part Two of Mounted Police Life in Canada. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Mounted Police Life in Canada by Captain Burton Dean. Chapter Fifteen, Part Two: Wholesale Cattle Smuggling. On May twenty-fifth, our herd of American cattle numbered about seven hundred and fifty head. Taylor came to our camp for dinner that day, and after looking through the seized stock, told Bournette that there was not a four-year-old steer in their herd. This was an indication of what his line of argument was likely to be, and in the course of a thirty-mile ride with George Lane that morning, how a dispute as to age between our experts and the Spencer's representative could be conclusively settled. He said the only way would be to have a veterinary surgeon on the spot. As a last resource, an animal in dispute could always be thrown aside and its mouth could be examined, and a disinterested veterinary surgeon would be the best person to examine the teeth. He would be able to tell to a certainty. When Lane left us, as he did that afternoon for home, he carried with him from me a letter to the commanding officer at Calgary, asking him to send his veterinary officer to join our camp, and he did so. The significance of the two riders reported by George Lane appeared about this time. It was proposed to move the camp in a northeasterly direction for about eight miles, and Voice was sent to look over the ground. The northeast corner of the range was black with cattle when we first began our work, but Voice came back and reported now that they had been driven off. He found a trail leading southwest, showing tracks of a large band of cattle and of galloping horses, which had been used in herding them off the hills into the coolies. By the sign of the tracks, this had been done within about thirty-six hours. We also found deep-cut wheel marks of a wagon going in the same direction. This was no more than we had expected, and we were in no way disconcerted. At the worst, it could only mean that we might have to prolong our stay and go over the range again. There was no hope of the cattle being able to get away from us, as, if they went into Montana, the customs officers there would seize them, so we did not worry. Our routine from day to day was pretty much the same. Breakfast at about 4.15 a.m. or 4.30 a.m., ride all the forenoon, dinner at noon, ride all the afternoon, supper at six or thereabouts. Sometimes we had to move camp every day. Sometimes it would be a fixture for two or three days, according to how we found the cattle. We had to drive with us our seized herd, wherein were innumerable calves. They had to be moved slowly, and the number of cattle, of course, increased from day to day. Matters by this time reached such a stage that some definite pronouncement had to be made as to the plan upon which the seizure was to be conducted. 
My colleague and I had never been able to agree upon this point. He had spent most of his life in the maritime provinces, seizing bottles of illicit rum from fishing smacks and the like, and knew as much about cattle as a cow knew about side pockets. He was not even willing to learn. He argued that the Spencers had paid duty on 1,230 head of stock, and that we should seize all over that number of American brands that we could find. This proposition was too childish to waste time in discussing, and I told him so. For want of something better to say, he finally observed that his deportment was in charge of the operations, and that what he, as representative of the customs, said was final. Considering that he was as useless as a fifth wheel to a coach, this was calculated to make a plain man mad, and I am free to confess that it made me as mad as a wet hen. I stumped out of the tent, leaving behind me as a Parthian shot. You'll find that I settled this question, irrespective of your department's representative. I called to my clerk to bring writing pad and pencil, and together we retired to a convenient spot, where he sat on the prairie and wrote, and I walked about and dictated. The following is a verbatim copy of what he wrote. Memorandum of Details for Settlement with Spencer Brother and Company by Superintendent Dean. On April 25, 1900, they imported 527 calves. Of these, 224 were entered at Coots as being under six months old. The remaining 303 were entered on the same date at the same place as being over six and under 12 months. As a yearling is not properly so called until he has become 12 months old, as a two-year-old is not properly so called until he is twenty-four months old, and as a three-year-old is not properly so called until he has completed thirty-six months of age, it will be seen that none of the 527 calves was thirty-six months old on April 25th, 1902. By May 25th, 1902, one month later, it might be plausibly claimed that some of them had become three-year-olds. A liberal method, therefore, of estimating the possible number may be arrived at in the case of the 303 calves which were entered as being over six and under 12 months on April 25, 1900. In the first place, it may be fairly presumed that the 303 calves were half steers and half heifers. We may thus consider them to have been 152 heifers and 151 steers, plus odoms. As the age of the calves were spread over a period of six months, it is reasonable to divide the number of heifers and steers by six, and thus to assume that 27 heifers and 26 steers had, on May 25, 1902, entered the category of three-year-old animals. The entry at Coots, giving the ages of these animals, as shown by the customs records, will, I presume, be held to mean exactly what it expresses, neither more nor less. It is important that this should be definitely understood, as, in conversation with Mr. Butternot the other day, Mr. Taylor prepared the way for a change of front by saying that a mistake had been made in the entry at Coots. He appeared to claim that a mistake had been made in the number of calves entered, but he also mentioned, quite incidentally, that some of the calves were fourteen months old. I called Mr. Butternot's attention to this remark afterwards. Upon this premise, namely that the entry at Coots was correct and was made in good faith, I am, in the opinion of competent stockmen, making a liberal computation when I allow one-sixth part of the 303 calves to be classed as three-year-old steers and heifers on May 25, 1902. This presupposes no casualties to have happened to any of them. These animals are said to have been branded double roll -lock and J7 on the left side. I desire to draw particular attention to these 26 steers qualifying as three-year-old animals, because it will account for the only three-year-old steers of American brands lawfully in possession of Spencer Brothers and Company in Canada. On December 7, 1900, the firm imported and paid duty on a 189 cows and 80 heifers, the calves, 268, imported on that occasion, are too young to require attention. The brands on these animals were entered as Double Rolock, J7, 
and quarter circle F. On April 20, 1901, the firm paid duty on 82 cows and 20 heifers, described as being then about two years old. The brand on this importation was entered as double roll lock on the left side. The total number then of cows and heifers three years old and upwards, which Spencer Brothers and Company have lawfully in their possession on May 25, 1902, equals 189, plus 80, plus 82, plus 20, plus 27, all of which amount to 398. A certain proportion of female stock is always unprolific, being called dry stock. Competent stockmen tell me that estimating the proportion of dry stock at 30% is in reality an underestimate, so that if it be conceded that Spencer and Company should receive a calf within each of the 398 cows to which they are entitled, they cannot complain of illiberality. This very number, 398, should be subject to deduction from losses, etc., but the fact that none is claimed by the government again bespeaks liberality. In the number of cattle which had been rounded up, there are a number of steers of three, four, five years old and upwards. These animals all bear American brands, have not been entered at customs, and are thus valuable and seizable property. I may here again say the allowance of the 26 just-turned three-year-old steers, as previously mentioned, is a liberal concession to the firm of Spencer's. Following the same rule as is suggested for the steers, all cows bearing American brands of three years old and upwards, whether with calves or not, are liable to seizure and confiscation, and these and the steers will constitute the most valuable part of the seizure. There is no difficulty whatever in conducting the seizure upon these lines. Competent cattlemen are as well able to tell the age of a two-, three-, or four-year-old animal, etc., as they are to read the lines of a book. Mr. Lane had provided in the personnel of his roundup an expert in this matter, and in the event of any dispute arising as to an animal's age, we have, upon Mr. Lane's advice, fortified ourselves with professional veterinary opinion in the person of Staff Sergeant Hobbs. The dictum, therefore, of Mr. Henry, the expert, of Mr. Playfair, captain of the Roundup, and of Staff Sergeant Hobbs, may be held as to be unassailable wherever they are agreed upon a point of age. And such opinion need not fear be controverted in a court of law. Spencer Brothers and Company may plausibly plead that the American-branded steers, etc., now on their range here have strayed across the boundary line and joined their cattle here without their knowledge. Against that there are two circumstances to be considered. First, Arthur Strong told me on May 24th last, in connection with the entry of 527 calves at Writing on Stone on April 25th, 1900, when I told him that I held a warrant for his arrest for aiding and abetting and smuggling cattle into Canada, as per affidavit of John Rice, that he had not smuggled any cattle as charged, that on the occasion in question he had, in accordance with his orders, driven 400 head of cattle over and above the calves aforesaid as far as the boundary line and left them there. He protested that he did not know whether they came into Canada or not. Secondly, we know from Mr. Stock Inspector Bray's report that on May 2nd last, Spencer Brothers shipped four beef cattle branded double roll lock on the left side, that is, the American brand. It remained for the firm to show whether these animals were ever duly entered at customs. The two circumstances are at least suspicious. I have thought it advisable to record for the information of the Department at Ottawa, and possibly for future reference in the event of the matter ever finding its way into a court of law, exactly what my views and line of reasoning are while we are on the spot. To pursue this matter to its logical conclusion, there is, in my opinion, but one course open to us. We have now over 1,400 head of cattle. After the claims of Spencer Brothers and Company have been satisfied, as aforesaid, it will be found that in the balance remaining there will still be a considerable number of steers and cows of three years of age and upwards, and these should be seized, as Spencer Brothers and Company cannot have them lawfully in their possession, and the onus of proving that they are so rests with them. 
Badwater Lake, Alberta, May 31st, 1902. As soon as a fair copy had been made, I took it to Baronot and said, That is an outline of the basis of settlement. If you agree with it, you should sign it. If you do not agree with it, you would do well to detail your objections in writing. He studied it for a while and then said, It's all right. So we had no further dispute. Bourinot left on June 3rd for Coutts, from whence he sent to his department at Ottawa a long telegram which he had concocted. The reply read as follows. Commissioner instructs you to demand deposit of duty paid, valued for stock seized, such deposit not exceeding $10,000. Forfeited stock may be sold by private sale, if you deem this advisable, in case deposit not paid. The $10,000 limit was absurdly inadequate and rendered it useless for us to waste time and money by going again over the range in pursuit of the cattle that had been driven out of our way. So we turned over to Mr. Taylor and his men. Number one, 398 cows, three-year-olds and upwards with a calf to each cow. Two, 26 steers which had just attained the age of three years. Taylor, as expected, kicked like a steer about everything. I explained to him our method of settling the dispute and quoted from my record the maximum number of cows which he was entitled to receive, according to his own sworn customs entries. He retorted that he had never heard of such a thing as holding a man to months in the ages of cattle. Bourinot chipped in then. I told you in March, Mr. Taylor, that we would hold you to your entries, and that is what we are doing. We were quite firm, so finally he said he was satisfied with the cows and steers, and took them over as being three years and upwards. Next, we handed over to him some 348 head of less than three-year-old animals, which we did not want. This brought us down to the herd that we intended to seize, all three-year-olds and upwards. We asked Taylor if he had any objection to offer in respect to these, and he and his men started in and recklessly cut out about 150 head, which he claimed were two-year-old animals. We sat round and looked on, and in some cases laughed. Several of the cows were followed by two calves, a yearling and a calf, and he thought it good business to take the yearlings away from their mothers, as if we were such fools as not to see through this absurdity. One amusing incident happened. Taylor and our man Playfair disagreed about a steer. Playfair said, Look here, Taylor, I've just got fifty dollars here. You say that steer is not three years old, and I say it is. I will bet you fifty dollars on it. And if you will bet, I will take the money over to the captain there, and he shall hold it while we throw the animal, and let the vet examine its mouth. Taylor was not such a fool as to give away his money in that fashion, and declined the offer. Playfair then refused to take his objections seriously. After Taylor and his men had finished their afternoon's fun, we instructed our experts to cut back into the seized herd all of the 150 animals that they would positively swear to as being three-year-olds. They cut back all but 19 head. They said there might be doubt as to these 19, and they would not be prepared to swear without a mouth examination. This Taylor was particularly anxious to avoid. He was too good a cattleman not to know that he was wrong and a mouth examination not only would have discredited him in the eyes of his own men, but would have subjected him to derision all over the range and in the stockman's world. It was no part of our business to compel an examination. In the first place, the Customs Act throws upon the importer the onus of proof. Taylor was the importer, and the proof lay with him. In the second place, we were dealing with Spencer's cattle, if there was any throwing to be done, it had to be done by the Spencer's men. We should never have heard the last of it if an animal had been thrown by our men and a leg had been accidentally broken, perhaps, as was always possible. It was better policy for us to concede the nineteen head, which we did. We then asked Taylor if he was satisfied that the herd under seizure consisted of cattle three years old and upwards. He replied, To the best of my judgment... We then proceeded to count the seized herd and found 587 head. Taylor was nervous and lost the count. Voice gave it to him once again, but he lost it again. 
and was content to accept our figures. The more so as we had spent ten hours in the saddle, chewing the rag, over this very simple proposition. Next morning, the round-up left us, as its work was done, and well done, too. They had worked with us, and for us, loyally and well, and our personal relations were all that could be desired. Bourinot and his teamster left at the same time, heading for the railway. He had an engagement to meet Taylor at Medicine Hat, there to receive the required deposit, and it was my duty to stay with the herd, with voice, and the few men that I had as herders, until I should hear from Bourinot. The nights of the 14th, 15th, and 16th June were bitterly cold, with driving rainstorms at frequent intervals during the day. The cattle were restless and hard to hold, and I was mighty glad when word came about 3 p.m. on the 17th that the deposit was made and that the cattle might be released. I sent for Taylor to come and take them over, and we counted them out to him. 198 steers worth 42.50 each, 164 cows with calves worth $35 each, 225 dry cows worth $28 each. The total value was over $20,000. The prices quoted were the market prices of the day, and we knew of a man who was prepared to buy the cattle at those prices if there had been any hitch with the deposit. On June 18, we broke up our camp and started for the Mounted Police Detachment at Writing on Stone, about 40 miles distant. And it was about time, for our grub had run out, the rains had spoilt most of the little flour we had left, and we had but a scanty breakfast that morning. Having to make a detour on business, I had a ride of fifty-three miles before I got my next meal, and that was not till half-past three in the afternoon. We had all become a little tired of the job. The work had been very tiresome and monotonous during the last few days. We had driven an ever-increasing number of cattle, which finally amounted to about 1,400 head. For about seventy miles, and had not lost even one calf. My horses had carried me for over 900 miles between May 14th and June 19th, which was as much as I dared to take out of them, considering that one was 22 years of age, dandy by name, dandy by nature, and the other turned out to have a poor constitution. Old Dandy delighted in cutting a refractory steer out of a bunch, he would cock his ears and watch the brute, and turn like a flash at the slightest touch of a rein, laid flat on his neck. That is the cowboy fashion, and I never insulted the old chap's mouth by pretending to know he had a bit in it. He and I, on one of the closing days of the round-up, had finally cut out a steer that had given us a lot of trouble. Willard Humphreys, an American cowboy, one of Spencer's men, had been looking on from the outside of the circle and when i pulled up alongside of him he said the old horse did that well cap'n but i don't like to see him do it why not i queried oh because he's too old he shouldn't have to do that in his old age i believe you're right said i i'll never do it again and i never did for my share in this seizure i was peremptorily ordered to be transferred from lethbridge to maple creek i had been in lethbridge for fourteen years so there was, as the western expression goes, no kick coming to me. I simply packed up and went, and, by the irony of fate, stumbled upon the other instances of graft which I have previously mentioned. I carried with me the grim satisfaction of knowing that I had worked up a case in which there was not a single flaw, and which could not fail to be upheld by every tribunal in the Dominion. In spite of all the information at their disposal, the customs department became weak-kneed. How this malady was induced may be better imagined than described, and returned to the Spencers, or the representatives, four thousand of the ten thousand dollar deposit, thus defrauding the revenue of the round sum of fourteen thousand dollars, besides the further unknown quantity represented by the hundreds of smuggled cattle which we had not been permitted to round up. The Spencers, then, had the audacity to bring a suit against the government for the $6,000 which the customs held. This action was tried in the Exchequer Court at Medicine Hat on December 2, 1904. 
They had filed in the court a perfect avalanche of affidavits, in which they denied pretty nearly everything that had been reported against them. One instance will serve to show the class of impotent falsehood that they generated, for the falsity of every document was exposed at the hearing. One of the affidavits purported to have been made by Art Strong, wherein he flatly contradicted the story that I had told about meeting him near the camp, and said that such a conversation never took place. In the witness box, under cross-examination, Strong freely and unequivocally admitted that he had met me, and had told me about his connection with the 900 cattle in April 1900. So open and ingenious was his admission that the judge remarked, Ah, these affidavits have been prepared. One of our witnesses, Peter Enos, who had helped Sam Spencer to smuggle some 800 cattle into Canada at Pendant Dorai in October 1900, and was coming from Montana to tell his story under oath, swore in the witness box that while he was on his way, the then mayor of Great Falls, a bosom friend of the Spencers, had offered him $250 not to come to court. When that inducement failed, he was plied with liquor and made so helplessly drunk that it was quite a job to sober him up in time to give evidence. However, we managed it, and he gave good evidence too. The result of the trial was a foregone conclusion. Mr. Justice Burbage said that he could give the suppliants no relief. He remarked that the amount sued for represented only a small proportion of the value of the cattle seized and this was an indication of the trend of his thoughts. The disappointed suppliants appealed from the decision of the Exchequer Court to the Supreme Court of Canada, which affirmed the judgment of the court below, and that settled the matter. Some years ago I cut out a fragment of some newspaper, the name of which I do not know, the following poem, with which, with apologies to the author, it seems to me I may fitly close my narrative of this episode. It was a unique experience for a police officer, and I would not have missed it for the world. The Cowboy's Prayer The following poem, written under the above caption, signed Charles B. Clark, Jr., contains a whole sermon whose broadness might be commended to some clerical teachers. O oh Lord, I've never lived where churches grow. I love creation better as it stood. That day you finished it so long ago and looked upon your work and called it good. I know that others find you in the light that's sifted down through tinted window panes, and yet I seem to feel you near tonight, in this dim, quiet starlight on the plains. I thank you, Lord, that I am placed so well, that you have made my freedom so complete, that I am no slave of whistle, clock, and bell, or weak-eyed prisoner of wall and street. Just let me live my life as I've begun, and give me work that's open to the sky. Make me a partner of the wind and sun, and I won't ask a life that's soft or high. Let me be easy on the man that's down, and make me square and generous with all. I'm careless sometimes, Lord, when I'm in town, but never let them say I'm mean or small. Make me as big and open as the plains, as honest as the horse between my knees clean as the wind that blows behind the rains, free as the hawk that circles down the breeze. Forgive me, Lord, when sometimes I forget. You understand the reasons that are hid. You know the many things that gall and fret. You know me better than my mother did. Just keep an eye on all that's done and said. Just write to me sometimes when I turn aside, and guide me on the long, dim trail ahead that stretches upward to the great divide. End of chapter 15, part 2